Good morning. We're going to get started. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you for coming um, today um, to celebrate and sort of honor uh, those we've lost to addiction uh, on International Overdose Awareness Day. Uh, this is sort of a special remembrance ceremony. Uh, I'm Mitchell Netburn, uh, President and CEO of Samaritan Daytop Village. Um, and I want to um, sort of uh, welcome our co-host, uh, Dr. Dara Cass, um, who's the Regional Director of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services for Region 2. Um, she's co-sponsoring uh, this event with us. Uh, and I also want to thank not just her, but her staff who have been very helpful and instrumental, uh, as well as, of course, my staff. Uh, they, I wouldn't hear it if I didn't thank them. <laughs> They've been really, really great in pulling this together. And obviously, uh, the powers that be uh, helped with the weather. It's a perfect day for this. Um, we're going to hear from uh, several um, guests during the, the program. Uh, New York State Senator uh, Luis Sepulveda, who will be here shortly. This is his district. And we have with us uh, uh, Natalia Fernandez, uh, who uh, not only um, yeah, represents the Bronx and part of West Chester. You'll hear more about her later, but a, re a leading voice uh, in our state around addiction issues. Uh, we have uh, Janet uh, Peguera, the Deputy Bronx Bar President who's here representing the office of the borough president, Vanessa Gibson, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, uh, but she was, she was here for our, our opening uh, ceremony. Um, we also have uh, Santa Soriano Vasquez, the director of intergovernmental affairs for the city, New York City Council, uh, representing speaker Adrian Adams, Brian Berry, a peer worker uh, for the citywide addiction support network at Park Queens, who will share his personal experience with overdose, addiction, and recovery. And our keynote speaker, Dominic DuPont, who will reflect on the loss of his uncle, the late actor, Michael K. Williams. Um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and Samaritan Data Village came together on International Overdose Awareness Day because the opioid epidemic is one of the country's most urgent health care crises. And I just want to you know, say that again, health care crisis. We view addiction as a health issue. Um, and that is, you know, one of the messages uh, that is key for us to, to get out. Prevention, awareness, and harm reduction initiatives are key to stopping the tragic rising death rate, as well as specialized treatment and recovery services. But while we are working to prevent and treat addiction, we must also remember and honor the souls lost to overdose. And while reflecting on that loss, we must not forget to look to the future filled with hope as we celebrate the many brave individuals who have worked to overcome addiction and live day by day in recovery. Collectively, we felt that the Richard Press Wellness Center, where we're holding this event, was fitting because this is really sort of the epicenter of overdose deaths in New York State. Everywhere, every day, somewhere in New York City, eight people die of an overdose and the highest number is right here in the Bronx. In fact, more people have died from overdose in the Bronx than in any other county. And when you look even further at the data, you, you may not know this, but the most affected neighborhoods have been Hunts Point and Mott Haven, the very neighborhood where this building is located. I just want to make one last comment. The opioid epidemic is not a local occurrence. It is happening across the world. And we at Samaritan Data Village had the unique opportunity recently to witness the impact this epidemic had on another country. Last month, a few of us traveled to South Korea at the request of Dr. Oh, the minister of the Korean Ministry of Food and Drug Safety, who had visited one of our programs in Rockland County that, amongst other things, treats uh, adolescents. Addiction is increasing exponentially in South Korea particularly among younger people, including teens. Concerned government officials asked us to help them develop drug prevention and treatment programs to target their youth and help reverse this disturbing trend. For those that don't know, DATOP had, you know, which we merged with a few years ago, uh, has had a long history of about over 20 years working around the world, helping people with different countries with their addiction issues and particularly in South Korea. So addiction is not limited to this neighborhood, the Bronx, New York State, or even the United States. It is truly a worldwide epidemic. That, and the important message is that it 
un unlike some epidemics, there is hope, there is treatment, and it can be stopped. We recognize that every person lost to overdose was someone's friend, neighbor, colleague, you name it. They all deserve a moment when we can collectively stop, breathe, and remember. So at this time, I'd ask us to take a moment of silence for all those lost to overdoses. Thank you. Also, if, if you have time on your way out, we have a memory tree downstairs. If you didn't see it when you came in, you can write the name of anyone you've known lost overdose um, as a way to remember and honor them. Um, and now it's my honor and pleasure to welcome Dr. Dara Kess, as I said, the, the uh, regional director, the director for the Region 2 of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you, Mitchell, and thank you everyone here today, everyone at Samaria and Daytime Village, all of our partners, elected officials, and actually everybody here in the community that has come together to um, highlight how important it is to spend time thinking of those that we've lost to overdose and recognizing the opportunity we have to prevent overdoses from happening again. As mentioned, I am Dr. Dara Cass, the Regional Director for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And on behalf of everybody at HHS, including Biden-Harris Administration and Secretary Javier Becerra, we are grateful here to commemorate this very important day. Of course, we pause to honor those who have died from overdose and recommit ourselves to help those that are struggling every single day. I come to my role as a regional director as an emergency medicine physician, and I'm no stranger to the devastating impact that this epidemic is having. I will let others speak to the statistics and the lived experiences, but spend a few minutes outlining how our department and this administration is helping to turn the tide on this epidemic. Addressing the overdose crisis is a top priority at HHS. At the direction of Secretary Javier Becerra, we're de we developed a new strategy to address the evolving nature of the broadened overdose crisis. The overdose prevention strategy includes four priority areas, and we have invested billions of dollars in helping this come to fruition. First is primary prevention. This includes supporting research to develop and improve the delivery of preventative interventions, as well as reducing clinically inappropriate prescribing practices with misuse potential while still recognizing the need to prescribe medications to those who need it. Harm reduction. This includes expanding evidence-based harm reduction services and integrating them within the healthcare delivery system, expanding sustainable funding strategies for harm reduction services, and developing educational materials and programs to reduce stigma. Evidence-based treatment. This includes expanding the development and access to new treatments and strategies to improve engagement and retention and care, increasing the uptake of evidence-based treatment delivery that improves engagement and retention and care, promoting evidence-based integration for people who have co-occurring conditions across lines of service and care settings, and recovery support. Treatment alone is not enough for long-term recovery. This recovery support includes enabling access to and encouraging the use of integrated recovery support services improving the quality of coordinated recovery support services and strengthening the recovery support service workforce. And again, acknowledging programs like our CCBHCs, right, our Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics, which help integrate wraparound services for people who need support in every aspect of mental health, including substance use disorder, is critical to the uh, prevention and treatment and forward moving progress that this administration has committed itself to. Our combined efforts are beginning to make a difference. Last fall, Secretary Becerra marked the one-year anniversary of the HHS overdose prevention strategy by announcing the progress this nation has made since the release of the strategy, showing expanded treatment, lives saved from overdose, and the commitment to long-term recovery supports. But our work is not done, and every day it feels like sometimes we're moving backwards 
you know, just by our own personal lived daily experiences. It goes without saying that our strategy cannot reach members of the community without our invaluable partners like here at Samaritan Daytop Village and all the organizations that you in the audience represent. Our on International Overdose Awareness Day, we remember that despite our strong recommitment, our work on overdose awareness is far from over. And it is only through our sustained partnership efforts that we can work to prevent these devastating fatalities one life at a time. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you so much for coming here. And I'm going to hand it back off to Mitchell to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Cass. And uh, those that don't know, Dr. Cass oversees uh, New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands and New York State's eight federally recognized tribal nations. So we're particularly honored that she chose Samaritan Daytop Village uh, for today's uh, service. Um, also now please uh, to introduce our next speaker, Senator uh, Luis Sepulveda. I know he's gonna cut me off, so I'll be quick, uh, because this is his, at least of my count, at least his third time here. He was here for our groundbreaking. He was here for our uh, ribbon cutting, and, and today, and today, and today, and today, and today. For issues dear to our heart, uh, healthcare, housing, social services. He's worked you know, tremendously to eliminate the stigma of mental health in New York State. He helped create the New York State Suicide Prevention Task Force, uh, champions the expansion of community health and mental health services in the Bronx, and always seeking new ways to eliminate health disparities. Uh, he continues to knock down barriers, and as I said, he's going to cut me off, so <laughs> I will get off. <laughs> If you really have any interest in my accomplishments, you can go to my website, really. <laughs> this is great to, to be here, and I come back because Samaritan Village is a story of success. We in this country are starting to see a shift in the narrative about addiction and addiction prevention. We're still not there yet because there's still a significant element of fear that people have to have discussions about addiction or to discuss policies that can help reduce addiction in a significant way. Just this morning, uh, I was reading something in the New York Daily News about, I believe it was a, a, an opinion in the editorial, where an individual says that we have the way of reducing addiction with these prevention centers. Sometimes people go and they inject themselves with the drug at these centers in a healthy way, in a safe way. And in fact, of the hundreds of these prevention centers that exist, there's not a single, single case where someone died of an overdose while in the center. That is success. Yet in our budgets, we still don't put enough money into these kinds of programs. Programs that have proven to eliminate addiction and save lives. And it is fear. I've been in politics now 31 years. I had a lot more hair, and I was a lot better looking. Um, from where it started, where the denigration and subhumanization of individuals that had addiction was prevalent. But now you're seeing some changes. I believe these changes occurred was because of opioid addiction and addiction in general has now entered the wealthier white communities in this country. Where once upon a time it was lock them up and throw away the key, now the element of humanity, the element of treatment, is now starting to dominate the narrative. Now, it's unfortunate that it took that, it took that creeping into different communities before they became more concerned with black and brown communities. It seems to be a pattern in our country, but it's people like Samaritan Villages, people like all of you, my elected officials like Senator Fernandez, that prevent from fear overtaking us. And we continue to work for policies and put money in policies, and we'll continue to work to make sure that those programs that are effective is what dominates the conversation, not fear. 
I know we're here to celebrate, uh, to honor those who have been victims of addiction. Three weeks ago, I lost a family uh, member to an overdose addiction. So I understand what this means and I understand the problem. It's a member who just could not overcome. A story that everybody knows. So I'm happy to be here today. I pledge my commitment to be here today. I think I probably violated about 17 traffic laws on my way here from the city. But it was well worth it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Samaritan Village, for the great work that you do. Thank you, Senator Sepulveda. Uh, we're also honored to have uh, with us uh, New York State Senator Fernandez, whose district covers the Bronx and Westchester. Uh, she has a laser focus on substance use and mental health concerns. That is no exaggeration. Uh, she chairs the Senate Alcoholism and Substance Use Disorder Committees, Committee. She co-chairs the Joint Senate Task Force on Opioids, Addiction, and Overdose Prevention, and is a member of the Cannabis and Mental Health Committees, among numerous others. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning, everyone. Thank goodness for the beautiful day. A little chilly, I didn't check the weather. Um, but regardless, blessful to be here. And I'm so in, in motivated and empowered to be in a space in a room with so many like-minded people that have compassion at the forefront. We're facing an epidemic, we know this, we see it, we're working in it, we're learning continuously, and we're educating continuously. In my position, in my time as the chair, but also an advocate before, one of the biggest challenges is always trying to get others to see what you see, to see the beauty and, and humanity in those that are suffering with substance use disorders. And I do wanna highlight that that term, substance use disorders, because that was one of the first things that I did as the chair of the committee. It was alcoholism and substance abuse. But we know that those that are using substances are not trying to abuse themselves. They're not trying to hurt themselves, nor do they want to hurt their families. But the struggle is real, and they need that support. They need that encouragement, that upliftment to know that you can overcome it. So changing the name is part of changing the stigma substance use disorders, because as we mentioned, this is a healthcare crisis. This is something we must address as a disease, and it must be supported and guided through it as one. And today, we tried to make it official in New York State. We did pass it in the Senate. Thank you to my colleagues for, for passing and voting in it. And we still got to get it through the Assembly. But we want it to be known in New York State as well, as well as in this nation, that today, August 31st, is Overdose Awareness Day. And Senator, my condolences to your family member, sincere condolences. Because yes, it affects that person, but it really does affect the family too. And that's what I think we're continuing to learn as well, that someone who is suffering with addiction, it doesn't just hurt them, it hurts the family around them, the community around them. And when you lose that person, it's, it's a ripple effect. And here the Bronx, uh, I feel grateful knowing that I come from a place that is the epicenter because now I have a perspective that I can give to the rest of the state. But I need the rest of the state to see what's happening in their own backyard, in the Bronx, in their neighboring town, and across the country. And changing the stigma, changing how we, we, we think of some of the, the, the recovery methods, we need to keep pushing it because, yes, there are solutions out there that have 100% success rates, but stigma and poli politics, not even policies, politics has held us back. And I think we're, we've reached a point that we can't be held back anymore. We are really at a crisis. We're seeing it every day. And unfortunately, there are going to be naysayers, i.e. the New York Post, that wants to keep painting this problem and this crisis in a way that is not our fault. And in a way, it can be our fault. We know that capitalism has driven opioids into our markets, into our doctor's offices, and was a part of what the epidemic is now. But 
today. I take this as our, our next step, our, our day of motivation, as much as every day is a day of motivation, because every day we are seeing successes. We are seeing clients come back ready to continue the next day with new goals, with short-term goals, and that's what I think is, is a key to it. You know, not just looking at where you are 10 years from now, but looking at where you are tomorrow and what you can do today and tomorrow and next week to make your family, your life, your community, and yourself better. So I really do thank Samaritan Daytop. You've done amazing work for years, for years and years. And personal story, my brother graduated high school because of Samaritan Daytop. Yeah, he was, um, was a bad kid, you know, didn't. <laughs> His high school gave up on him, kicked him out. Um, and because the school knew that he was smoking cannabis, they said, why don't you talk to Daytop Samaritan because they'll help him get his GED. And they took him in and they helped him get his GED and he was able to walk across the stage with his high school. So thank you for that. And in addition to thanks, I have proclamations from the chair of the committee um, to Dr. Dara Cass and to Mitchell Netburn. Because the work that you do has been saving lives every single day. <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> After they've left treatment and are living their lives in recovery. We've heard many stories from former clients who turned their lives around after having an experience with an overdose. Today, today you'll hear from someone who is a father, son, military veteran, overdose survivor, Samaritan Data Village employee, and a person in recovery. Please welcome Brian Barrett, very peer worker for the Citywide Addiction Support Network. And he works at our center in Queens. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Brian Berry. My name is Brian Berry. Uh, I couldn't hear in the back, so I'm standing a little close to this mic. It's uh, truly a pleasure to be here, and I'm grateful because um, I didn't have to be here. And uh, I want to thank God, and I want to thank Samaritan Village, you know, for helping me get myself together. A um, little bit about myself, I'm a military veteran out of New Jersey, struggled with alcohol, you know, that was the culture in the uh, military at that time, and, you know, uh, used marijuana, cocaine, crack, and eventually heroin, you know. I always thought I was a good guy, but, um, you know, I just had a little problem until it became a big problem. Uh, tried many times to stop on my own, and, um, I wasn't successful, you know. I went to a treatment center before Samaritan Village, and um, you know, I got a good amount of clean time. Got a got a year in, and I was doing my push-ups, and you know, my chest was big, but um, my mind wasn't really right. wasn't I didn't have the right focus, and uh, so I decided to go back around my old hood and show the fellas, you know, that I got this thing. You know, I got it now, fellas. Look at me. I could do it, you could do it. And I ended up buying everybody one more. You know, and I took one little, one just a little pinch, and I blacked out. I woke up in a hospital, UMDMJ, right in New Jersey, uh, on a hospital bed. You know, I had an overdose. Didn't even realize it. My side was killing me, my liver was inflamed. The doctor said my, my organs almost shut down. You know, so I stayed in there for a few hours. They discharged me. I came back to treatment, not at Samaritan Village, but in another place. And I uh, kept it a secret. And, you know, I, I, I thought I was all right. So, uh, make a long story short, I completed the program, went back to my family. You know, I have three wonderful children. You know, I just had a baby boy, my last son. And, uh, you know, I. Fairly intelligent guy, I could work, I had a few jobs in my time, but um, I really didn't understand that I had a problem. You know, I have a disease of addiction, and uh, 
I didn't have the tools to address that. So um, I remember I might have survived out there six months just working, living with my family. And I remember at the family barbecue, my mother-in-law says, can you have a beer? I was still doing my push-ups. I said, yeah, I could, of course I could have a beer, <laughs> you know? And I had a beer and nothing happened, you know? And maybe two weeks later, I had two or three beers. And uh, six months later, I'm back to doing what I know how to do, you know, sniffing coke, and, you know, which eventually led me back to um, other substances. I'm going to speed it up because they told me I'm limited in time, but um, <sighs> I took a few losses. My mother passed. You know, I got a whole bunch of lawsuit money and, settlement money um, I had a large amount of money and, and my disease progressed to the point where I was drinking and using drugs every day and I broke my leg they put me on Oxycontin and that sleeping giant that I thought I put to bed woke back up fast forward six years later I'm homeless you know I, uh, I uh, lost a job you know, I had to leave my house. My children's mother and I couldn't get along at that point. The disease kicked over. That was more important than me being a father and a husband, you know, and a brother and a son to my family. You know, I was out there chasing. And um, I had to come back to treatment. Thank God I came to Samaritan Village. I went to Ed Thompson's veteran facility. And um, I entered that program. You know, I went to Detox, of course, and I went to Ed Thompson's Veterans Facility. I met good people, good people, and I came to Park, Queens to, uh, to participate. I ended up taking the recovery course coach, learning more about my addiction. Uh, I got a great trainer, you know, who taught me more about, you know, what I was dealing with. He's sitting right there. His name is AJ. And, um, you know, I, I learned about... That recovery coach course really taught me, you know, some of the things, the challenges that I had and things that I needed to work on every day. You know, I also started doing 12-step in A. Thompson, you know, which helped me out a lot. Um, eventually, I took an internship at Park Queens, Samaritan, Park Queens, the Peer Recovery Center, and uh, right off Jamaica Avenue. And um, I was able to give back in helping others it helped me focus on my recovery. You know, that's the beautiful thing about this recovery. You know, if I help others, it, it keeps it really fresh and it keeps it really green for me, and I love that. Uh, I was hired full time as a recovery coach at Park Queens, and um, I actually got a promotion six months later for Castle. Um, you know, so every day it's just you know. <clears throat> I'm almost coming to tears because it's been it's been it's been such a ride, a joyous ride, and um, I don't think I'm leaving anything out here. But I'm still a part queen, still working for Samaritan. I love it. I love coming to work. I love giving back. Love helping people, and I'm very thankful to be here. And um, thank you. Thanks for letting me share. Thank you, Brian, and it's really us. I have to thank you for sharing with us. And um, one of the things that Samaritan Daytop Village is particularly proud of is that uh, many of our staff are people who have either been through our programs or in recovery themselves. It's something we pride ourselves on, um, and they are role models uh, for our clients, for all of us who work at Samaritan, um, and it, it is really one of our hallmarks. Um, our next speaker is uh, sort of our, our keynote, so to speak. Um, Dominic Dupont. Um, he's going to share his story, of, personal story of a lost beloved relative. Uh, for those of you who have not met him, and I just did briefly, uh, he's an extraordinary example of redemption and positivity in the face of adversity. Uh, when he was 19, he was charged and convicted for murder. While serving 25 to life, he took many self-improvement and leadership programs and courses. Uh, because of his compact, uh, positive impact, uh, he was granted an executive clemency by our governor uh, when he was 20 years in, into his uh, sentence. Uh, since then, he's taken his personal experience and used it for good. 
He's consulted on shows like HBO's Vice, uh, can be seen in the documentary Raised in the System, and also a community liaison for the Theater of War Productions. Uh, we're really incredibly unfortunate to have him with us today to share uh, his experience with his uncle, Michael K. Williams, who died just two years ago, almost to the day, on September 6th. You know, please welcome Donald. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mitch. Uh I'd like to take a moment to just um, thank everybody who's here today. This is an extremely important day, extremely important. And, uh, and I'm honored to be here to recognize and acknowledge the people who we have lost. Um, so I want to thank you, Mitchell. I want to thank you, Alicia. Uh, I want to um, also thank the staff at Samaritan Village for inviting me here today to be part of International Overdose Awareness Day. On September 6, 2021, my uncle, Michael K. Williams, passed away from a drug overdose. It was such a painful moment for me to find him in his apartment in Brooklyn. Michael meant the world to me. I want you guys to know that um, a lot of people, when they think about Michael K. Williams, they think about Omar Devon Little, the Robin Hood of the hood. And uh, a lot of people also love his character, Chalky White. Um, but when I think of Michael, I think about a person who experienced loads of trauma and understood that the cure to the world's problems was love. And when you understand that, you understand the reason why we're here today, and you understand the importance of raising awareness about treatment and love and support. What you may not know is that my uncle actually went to Samaritan Village. Back then they called it Daytop. He was there for six months. I had an opportunity with my grandmother to visit him. And um, he talks about that in his memoir, Scenes from My Life. Uh, Michael's book came out um, a little bit over a year ago and um, he highlights the impact that Daytop and Samaritan Village had on his life. And, and, and when I think about this beautiful space and the support and the staff that's here, um, I have to say to myself that Michael would be very, very proud. And, um, and I have mentioned to Jill that I could see Michael winking at us. I could see him saying, you know, me losing my life was tragic, but it's also an opportunity to raise awareness and to have important conversations about how do we continue to support people who are dealing with substance abuse disorders and how important that work is. So, um, so I just wanna really like, just take this opportunity to let you know that um, Michael has, has meant and means so much to me. He was always there to support me during my years of incarceration. Um, the day that I was released, Michael was there, he was present. Um, every moment with him brought joy into my life. Every moment with Michael K. Williams brought joy into my life. Um, and I gotta tell you, I can give you tons of examples. I won't because you know, I wanna be mindful and respectful of people's times. But I can, I can tell you, um, we were shooting uh, a specific docuseries called Vice and we were in Baltimore. And a lot of what Baltimore looked like when they shot The Wire, currently to this day still looks like that. And we passed somebody who was in the street and who was homeless and was suffering. And Michael went up to them and said, listen, you know, how are you? My name is Michael. And they said, I thought your name was Omar. <laughs> and Michael said, well, that's what they call me on TV, but my real name is Michael. What's your name? And, um, and they said, my name is Jeff. And, um, and I realized at that time that um, it wasn't about who Michael was in his character. It was really about an opportunity 
for someone like him who's a TV star to recognize that someone was in need. And I have to tell you, when I came here today, I realized that the staff here wants to support people who are in need and wants to show support. Sometimes I often hear Michael's spirit saying to me, I truly value every human life. I always want to make sure that we face stigma, whether it's because of substance abuse, mental illness, homelessness, incarceration, or any other reason. I want to make sure that people feel seen. I want to make sure that people understand that we see them and that we value them. Moving forward, we really need to do a better job at helping people deal with addiction and helping them find successful pathways to reduce the influx of drugs on the street. Folks dealing with substance abuse need help so that they don't end up like the countless people that we have lost throughout the years. I know that Michael would be thrilled to see this facility and to see the Wellness Center offering fully integrated services, which includes drug treatment, peer leader recovery services, mental health counseling, primary health care, and even creative arts activities. I'm sure he would love the arts most of all. Michael was all about love and all about kindness. He always wanted to stop and spend time with people and help them understand how deeply and genuinely he would like to be there to support them. And he always took time to see, he, see people who were struggling and all who are too often invisible in this society. Samaritan, thank you for changing that view. I believe Michael's spirit is still here with us. Most likely, I could see Michael singing and dancing as he loved to do. We must continue his legacy by remembering how important it is to engage more deeply in developing solutions, especially with those who are struggling from addiction. It's so important to recognize every person that we lost to overdose. Remember, every person is important, every person is special, and most importantly, we have to continue the work of ensuring what it takes to help people thrive and be successful. Samaritan Village here is truly the model, truly the model of what I can see, what is needed to help save lives today. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Dominic, not just for being here, but for being such a strong voice uh, to do the exact things you said, bring awareness and hope. Uh, our next speaker will be Samaritan Daytop Village's uh, very own Eric Moore, who's our uh, program director of our Support and Connection Center, uh, one of only two in New York City, uh, and that um, really helps people uh, sort of in immediate need, uh, either whether due to addiction issues, mental health issues, um, and you know, they be brought there and truly receive just about any service uh, they need at that moment. Uh, so please uh, join me in welcoming Eric. My brother, Roderick McConnelly Moore, um, is counted in the number of those who died of an overdose. Uh, the numbers are countless, the numbers are overwhelming, the numbers are certainly disturbing, uh, but there is hope. Uh, there's hope. Uh, uh, you heard it in uh, Barry's disclosure. You heard it in Mr. DuPont. There is hope in the fact that our elected officials, Senator Sepulveda, Senator Fernandez is here, Dr. Cass is here with us. 
there is hope uh, because you are all here on this most glorious day. Um, not only to remember those that we've lost, um, but to say to the world that there is hope. Um, there is hope in Narcan that's being distributed. There's hope in fentanyl testing strips that are readily available. There is hope in uh, this beautiful program here, the Wellness Center. There's hope in the Support and Connection Center um, that I have the distinguished pleasure of being the program director at that provides short stay engagement and stabilization services, um, thereby preventing overdoses and helping people get on their feet. Uh, there is hope in heroism. Uh, we are all heroes here today. Uh, I consider myself as a hero and I don't take it lightly myself as somebody who has lived experience and now am able to on a daily basis provide hope to those men and women who I have the honor and, and good fortune of interacting with. And so, if you don't take anything away from this day, know that we are models to follow in that we are hope givers to those who are in desperate need of our services, our love, our connection, our support, um, so that we can continue to make an impact. Yes, the numbers are staggering, but I also argue that the numbers are staggering for those who are living and thriving and prepared to make a difference in the world in which we live today. And so thank you all for coming today. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, and as we continue um, to be hope givers to those who are so desperately in need of hope. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, and thank you so much for that message of hope. Uh, I haven't heard you say hope givers before. I really like that. So uh, I, with your permission, I will plagiarize uh, that. But, but, uh, but it, it, it really is very moving. Um, our next speaker is uh, Janet uh, Peguero, the deputy uh, Bronx Borough president, um, who uh, serves uh, you know, with, uh, under uh, Vanessa Gibson's administration. As I mentioned, she was here at our ribbon cutting. The borough president couldn't be here today. Um, uh, Janet's the first immigrant woman from the Dominican Republic uh, to serve in her role. Um, her mission is to implement the administration's plan to move the Bronx forward, and that includes equitable access to health and mental health care. Um, she's here uh, to uh, present a proclamation from the borough president. Um, so please uh, welcome, welcome her to the stage. Good morning, buenos dias. What a beautiful view from this rooftop right here in the Boogie Down Bronx. I wanna thank each and every one of you for being present today. I wanna to thank our keynote speaker for sharing such intimate but inspirational words with us this morning. Those words are words of encouragement, but also it gives us the blueprint for our assignment, right? Um, that this is a fight that isn't one that's fought alone, but in community. That each and every one of us has an assignment from public, public to um, community that all together we must join the fight. This is not a lonely fight, this is a community fight. And so thank you all, thank you so much to the Samaritan Daytop Village here. Um, again, thank you for this beautiful space. Thank you for, um, having us join in fellowship to commemorate International Overdose Awareness Day. The Office of the Bronx Borough President is humbled and honored to remember all the lives lost to overdose, but to celebrate those who live in recovery. And so we know the data in the Bronx, so I'm not gonna speak to that. Um, I'm gonna speak to the assignment that we have in the Bronx, right? Because the data is inequitable, we have an assignment. An assignment, nevertheless, uh, that inspires the work that we do each and every day at the Bronx Borough President's Office, an assignment that we do to influence our advocacy when it comes to policy and the allocation of resources. And so um, we know that overdose deaths are preventable, and we will join that fight to ensure 
that the resources that are needed um, are reaching the communities that need it the most. It's not about equality, it's about equity. Um, and so we know that uh, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene offers free overdose prevention and response training. It's something that our office um, takes advantage of. Recently, our office held a training session for staff to learn the steps for responding to opioid overdose with Nexalon. So it's not just about bringing the resources, but understanding the resources and how to utilize them. And so we are deeply dedicated. We know that these are life-saving trainings. Um, and even though there are 200 locations in the Bronx that provide some, some form of substance use and uh, disorder training or related services, um, including medication-assisted treatment, inpatient services, and detox programs, as well as counseling and transitional, um, individuals struggling with opioids use uh, um, often do not know where to get the help and are not sure where to start. And so the work that's being done here in community, in partnership, is truly remarkable and inspiring. So we thank you for your dedication to serve the community and raising awareness on issues which deeply affects our communities, not just the individual, but family um, and everyone that's involved. And so with that, this morning, I have the beautiful assignment of presenting a proclamation on behalf of the Bronx Borough President in recognition of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and Samaritan Daytop Village in their partnership in commemorating International Overdose Awareness Day. We truly and humbly appreciate your support and everything that you do to ensure safe and healthy communities. So on behalf of the Bronx Borough President and 1.4 million residents of the Bronx, not I, but the Borough President Vanessa L. Gibson hereby declares, proclaims Thursday, August 31st, 2023 as National Overdose Awareness Day. Congratulations and thank you so much for your dedication. Thank you so much, Janet, and uh, also, you know, please thank the Borough President, not just for the proclamation, her leadership on this issue, and her longstanding support of Samaritan Daytop Village. And I'm not sure I've ever told her, you know, I went to high school in the Bronx, so I, uh, you know, I'm, I was born and raised in, in New York City, you know, so I, I love all the boroughs, <laughs> but, but I, love the but I love the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, we have one more proclamation is uh, from Mayor Adams, uh, who could not be here today. Um, so I will uh, read it, uh, I guess, on his behalf. <laughs> um, so here it is. Um, Whereas a healthy city is a strong city, and my administration is using every tool at its disposal to ensure all New Yorkers have access to high quality physical and mental health care and other vital resources they need to thrive. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and Samaritan Daytop Village are tremendous partners in this mission. Today, I am pleased to join them as they host a ceremony at the Richard Press Wellness Center in the Bronx in honor of International Overdose Awareness Day. Whereas established in 2001, International Overdose Awareness Day is the largest annual campaign to end overdose. Remember without stigma those who have died, acknowledge the grief of the family and friends left behind while providing them with an opportunity to publicly mourn loved ones in a safe environment, <clears throat> some for the first time without feeling guilt or shame. In addition to raising awareness about one of the world's worst public health crises and spreading the message that the tragedy of drug overdose is preventable, this day is also an occasion to celebrate all those who live in recovery, to galvanize people to take action, discuss strategies for evidence-based overdose prevention and drug policy, and share information about the range of avail available support services. Whereas the opioid crisis has caused untold devastation and loss in our city, and no community has been spared. The COVID-19 pandemic further exacerbated substance misuse problems in the five boroughs and beyond. 
I am proud that New York City is leading the way in overdose prevention by investing an additional $150 million to strengthen our harm reduction and treatment programs. We are expanding access to overdose prevention centers, conducting public awareness campaigns about fentanyl, working with community, community ambassadors and organizations to distribute fentanyl tests, and increasing capacity of syringe service programs to conduct outreach and engagement and to distribute naloxone kits. I applaud our allies at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and Samaritan Data Village for their commitment to advancing the fight against addiction and overdose. And I look forward to the ongoing contributions of everyone gathered here today as we take bold steps to get stuff done, hashtag, and forge a brighter, safer, and healthier future for all. Now, therefore, I, Eric Adams, Mayor of the City of New York, do hereby proclaim Thursday, August 31st, 2023, in the City of New York as International Overdose Awareness Day. And our last speaker um, will be Alicia McFarlane, um, Samaritan Data Village's Chief Program and Legal Officer. Uh, she oversees all of our programs and all of our legal affairs, uh, and also uh, somehow in her spare time managed to, to really be one of the, the, the people that really helped put today, today together. So please join me in welcoming Alicia. Good morning, everyone. So as we draw this event to a close, I would like to express deep gratitude on behalf of our clients, as well as our staff, to all of our speakers today. Dr. Dara Kass, who also helped co-sponsor the event with us. Thank you, and thank you, team. Senators Sepulveda and Fernandez, Deputy Bronx Borough President Pegura, Dominic, Dominic Dumhapan, Brian Berry, and Eric Moore, your insights, your perspectives, and your words of encouragement and commitments have inspired our hearts today. I want to thank our community partners that I see in the audience. I see representation from Oasis, representation from the Bronx Office of the Court Administration. I see other programs in the audience. Thank you all for being here. To our CEO, Mitchell Netburn, it is through your vision and your guidance that we all stay encouraged. Thank you. And to our board members in the audience, thank you as well. And to John Ayamadio, who is our chief financial officer as well as our chief operating officer, thank you for all of your hard work. Today we gathered not just to reflect on the challenges of the opioid epidemic, but to also celebrate strength resilience, and the dedication of the com communities like ours, like, like the, the Bronx, the Boogie Down Bronx, as our borough president says. <laughs> we all know how grave the situation has been over the last year, couple of years and how many people we have lost. But we also need to remember that it has been our community partners, our families, and programs such as Samaritan that have remained dedicated and steadfast and been at the forefront of this battle. We are all here together to help turn the tides. To the substance use, treatment, and harm reduction community, your dedication to this cause has been unparalleled. Your tireless work saves lives every day. I know many of you are in subways, on street corners, and in parks, handing out Nalexon, teaching people how to use fentanyl testing strips, and encouraging them to come into doors of treatment programs similar to ours. Thank you for that. As a representative of Samaritan Daytop Village, I see firsthand the profound impact 
of our collective efforts. From the client who finds renewed hope to the family member who gets their loved one back, our mission is clear, to offer a lifeline to those in need and to help people help themselves. Let us remember the life of Michael K. Williams and many other clients who have sought treatment at Samaritan Detot Village and our other community programs. It is through their successes as well as their failures that we are reminded of why we do what we do. As we move forward, let's continue to amplify our efforts, collaborate across sectors, and keep the well-being of our community at the heart of everything we do. I urge everyone here, from elected officials to community members, to be ambassadors of change, hope, and resilience. Thank you all for being here today. I hope that as you pass through the halls of our wellness center, you are inspired as I am every day. I urge you and encourage you to participate in some of the other events we're having in the building later on after this one. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Alicia, and again, thank you to everybody for coming today, but more importantly for you know, what you do each and every day to help address you know, this terrible uh, epidemic. Uh, as Alicia said, we have a lot of activities today. Uh, there'll be uh, staff leading tours of the building on the first floor. Again, I mentioned in the beginning, we have our creative art therapist, Lucia Hernandez. And you can add a leaf to our memory tree to honor someone lost to an overdose. Uh, we're doing Narcan workshops. There will be a candle light vigil later today um, on the second floor. Um, and you're also welcome to stay on the balcony and enjoy both the beautiful day and the beautiful views. Again, thank you so much for coming.